and welcome to another edition of Virginia Arts Waiting in the Wings. We continue our series of chats with arts organization representatives to see just how they're faring during this COVID-19 pandemic. How have they adapted to the changing times and what creative solutions have they come up with to keep their doors open? as it were. Today we're focusing on music performance venues and joining me this time around are Jamie Cheatwood, venue manager for The Spot on Kirk, Tyler Godsey, director and founder of Five Points Music Sanctuary, Gary Jackson, general manager, Harvester Performance Center, Dylan Locke, owner and CEO of the Floyd Country Store, and Kate Pedigo, special events supervisor for Roanoke Parts and Recreation, which oversees Elmwood Park. Thank you all so much for being here. We try to do this show to really help showcase all of you and organizations like yours uh, and kind of sort of how you're coping through this craziness. Uh, let's start with you. Uh, let's start with Jamie. Um, how, did, how did everything kind of turn? How did you pivot when all of this sort of came about? Um, well, we immediately cut cost as much as we could and um, simplified things. Um, thankfully, we were mostly volunteer based to begin with, so we didn't really have to let a lot of people go. Um, but we switched to a live stream format for the time being, um, because even as some places are starting to reopen, our music hall is kind of narrow, so spacing right. people out isn't really an option. It's good for sound, not good for social distancing. Um, but we have been doing a live stream just about every week uh, since April and um, just rolling with the punches. Okay. How about you, Tyler? I know you're a little bit kind of a different entity because you, you kind of sort of, uh, as it says on your web <laughs> website, the platform to promote and support music therapy and hearing loss advocacy efforts. And part of what you do there, of course, are performances. Uh, how are you doing? Well, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head for us. Is that when we set up Five Points Music, it was really based upon creating a multifaceted organization that allowed us to take advantage of different points in economic cycles. Um, while we focused on live events, we really used our events as a way to fund and promote programs like music therapy, like hearing loss advocacy, and our accessibility programs on a broader level. Um, the venue itself is set up so that it brings in revenue, not just from our tickets and, and, and booze sales, but ultimately it comes in through fundraising mechanisms that comes through private venue rentals as well as long-term leases. Now, each one of these segments has certainly taken a hit and our ability to pivot to one or the other um, has not been as, uh, you know, as we might've predicted a couple years ago. However, the fact of the matter remains that versatility has allowed us to really kind of, you know, weather the storm and to shift our attention to, the, to some areas of our organization that really do deserve that uh, focus right now. And our accessibility initiatives are incredibly important to us. Um, we use these events, right, as a way to highlight some of these ideas. When we talk about accessibility, um, it's about how do we think about our world and be more empathetic to the challenges that we all are dealing with. To that end, um, we just purchased, and we'll have these out this weekend, but these smile masks, that are face masks that are clear. And these are, you know, sort of sound-friendly masks for people with hearing loss so that they can read lips. Me being deaf, um, it is incredibly difficult to live in a world with, with masks. Um, so it's some things like this within our organization. We take these sort of opportunities to explore um, what we can do to make our world more accessible and we use the show as a way to present that. So okay. Okay. it's been good for us. And I'll come back to you too and let you let all of you kind of talk as sort of about how, about how, how you're moving forward. <clears throat> well, it yeah. sounds like you're definitely moving forward, which is great. Um, Gary, uh, your, your venue is uh, kind of almost a cross between an intimate uh, performance venue. I mean, it's sort of, small but yet large enough i mean it's kind of an interesting uh, entity that you have there how are you faring well in mid-march we did a pause because of the virus and then in late april may and june we did live streams every friday and saturday night and we did start a gofundme page but all that money went to the united way food bank to help feed people that are having a tough time right now uh in July, I did open an outdoor venue across the street at the farmer's market. 
and we did the month of July. Uh, but originally I had, I think, 14 shows booked for July, but seven of those acts wanted to postpone. Oh. And August looked even bleaker. Uh, so we made a decision just to pause, and I have now moved all our shows from 2020 into 2021. Um, in September, we did do Harvester Outdoors is what we call it. We did do uh, four Saturdays of art shows with music at a place called The Coves on Smith Mountain Lake. And here in October, we've been doing concerts on Saturday. Uh, and then we're going to just pause through the end of the year and see what happens. Okay. All right. Uh, Dylan, uh, I know with you and your Friday night jamboree, and uh, you have also uh, probably similar to, uh, to Jamie, you have a very sort of tight space to work with. Um, how are you doing? Yeah, it's, um, it's been a hard transition. Uh, the Floyd Country Store is, um, you know, just this wonderful celebration of life. We're a lifeline to a lot of the community who've been coming here for um, decades and, you know, brings generations together. So we, we just love what this, um, what the Floyd Country Store means to this community and people come from all over the world to experience it, it with them. And um, so it's been a blow to have to let go of that. And, you know, there's been a lot of the people that really uh, have been missing it. So our first, um, you know, our first thing was to sort of hunker down, uh, try and protect our staff. There's a lot of people who work for us that really need, need uh, you know, need this as, as uh, a way to feed their families. And so, um, you know, we've got a large staff and we've really tried to keep them all on board. Uh, we did move our Friday night jamboree to uh, the space in back. Um, we definitely can't have large numbers of people in close proximity in our space. Uh, so we moved it out to the backyard and that, that was really great. It gave us a little bit of what it feels like to get together. Um, we put dance boards out so people could uh, still do some flat footing and get some, get some uh, exercise. And some of the visitors could still see what uh, a Friday night in Floyd feels like. Um, we've also, our, our um, nonprofit partner, Handmade Music School, has gone online and done virtual um, programming uh, called Handmade at Home, which uh, has really been offered at a very friendly, basically it's pay what you want, and it allows a lot of the touring musicians that aren't able to work right now to, to um, you know, work with other musicians, take classes um, and do that. So it's been, we've been just trying to get creative live streams. We've been doing a lot of live streams and connecting with our audience as well. Right, right. I, I would I would imagine that places that have, when, when you have sort of an outdoor possibility, you kind of have a little bit of a, of a, you know, ability to, to keep going, I guess you can say. Um, let's, uh, let's see, Kate, um, Elmwood Park. Obviously, outdoors, plenty yes. of space. How have you adjusted? Sure. Um, so kind of just worth noting, um, the nature of Elmwood Park is that it is a city park. Um, and my role in that is not only bringing events to it ourselves, and these are city-run events, um, but also helping the organizers who typically put on events in that park. Um, and so... As March came through and April came through, um, the conversation shifted from making the reservations to waiting and seeing what are we going to do, what's going to happen, um, and then to ultimately canceling. And it was just waves and waves and waves of organizers canceling um, or, you know, holding on to hope and rescheduling for later in the year, um, hoping that, you know, through we get through it through the summer and then come fall. Um, so we kind of had this, this blinky effect. Um, people, you know, who had normally planned their, their legacy events, the ones that you look forward to every year and you hear about happening at Elmwood, um, we're like, well, maybe we'll push it to September, October, November. Um, so there was a, a mad dash kind of for that. Um, and then a lot of it is just, you know, it was a lot of waiting and seeing and ultimately coming up to the point where you had to say, you know, we have to, we have to commit or we have to cancel. And unfortunately um, this year, everybody canceled. Um, right, so, right, right. So that's unfortunate. Um, we actually had a couple of events planned. Um, one of the most um, 
well-known one would would have been the Independence Day concert, um, which would have accompanied the fireworks show. Uh, so that one, uh, we didn't get to go on with that. Um, so yeah, unfortunately that was the, the situation. Everybody's plans out the window basically. So, so now everyone's sort of having to readjust, push a lot of things to next year. Um, let's see. So Jamie, yours is probably the smallest venue out of all of you. Um, how are you moving forward? Um, have you had, first of all, issues of artists who, you know, don't really want to perform in such a tight space. And then the ones that do perform, how are you handling that? Is that streaming? Um, we are only doing streaming right now. We are not doing any in-person events. And um, it's actually just me and my husband or the crew when we do a live stream. It's a pretty minimal setup. We have a really good condenser mic and interface, so the sound is high quality. Um, but it's basically us and a laptop to keep the artists safe. Uh, we wear masks, and of course, they wear a mask until they're on stage. And once they're on stage, we stay 10 feet apart. Mm. And um, we broadcast it on Facebook and Instagram. And then after the fact, we upload it to YouTube for people who don't do social media. And um, it's it's been all donation based so far. And we have focused on local artists because it's a lot to ask someone to travel um, for donations right now. Right, right. And that was my question is sort of how are you, you know, making an income? How are you how are you making the money? So and, and what kind of then uh, response have you had from the, the sort of the viewers? Are they really kind of stepping up to support you? They are. Um, thankfully, our sponsors have, have hung in there with us for the most part. And then we have been making donations on live streams. Um, one of the things about live streams is you know, you, you definitely sacrifice the intimacy that our venue is popular for, uh, but at the same time, you can reach so many more people than we would ever fit in there. So there are pros and cons. Um, we've had over 65,000 people reached by our live streams that would have never fit into our venue this year. Mm -hmm. um, but one neat thing that makes it a little more personal and not just like play into a screen is we give the artist the option uh, to read the comments aloud as they come in between songs so they know who's watching and they can interact with the crowd. And 100% of the time, they've said, yes, please. And right. so we've had family members from other states send in love. We've had um, friends who haven't seen each other in months. And mm. uh, in some cases, even band members, when someone plays a solo show, the rest of their band will will we'll tune in. So it's really helped people to feel a little less isolated. Uh, Gary and Dylan, I wanted to talk to you because both of you, I believe, have sort of music promoter kind of backgrounds. Um, Gary, how, how are you moving forward? Are you doing streaming online? What, what, what are you doing? No, the only things I'm doing are those shows in October out at the lake where people can literally sit 50 feet away from each other. We limit the capacity to 250, and there's mm -hmm. a, about a six-acre field there that we use. Um, uh, I'm just actively booking for next year, filling in the spaces. Uh, uh, for the, you know, the harvester right now, it's, it is being used for music, but it's all the school kids who come in and with their band teachers and practice in the main room where we can kids can sit 10 feet apart. Uh, they, I guess the schools don't have that kind of space to use. So sure. uh, a lot of afternoons, there's a lot of kids in mass with their teachers in mass giving lessons. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're also like the Red Cross is doing blood drives there. Uh, they take over the main room and set up for blood drives. Uh, sorry, I so had a B on me. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like you've kind of repurposed your space then. Yeah, I mean, it's a great spot and uh, uh, I'm glad and, I can do it. So. Right, because you're kind of a city government entity, a little similar to Elmwood Park, right? So you're right. kind of yes. just opening up to the community and letting them use it as, as they need it, sounds like. Yes, and uh, I'm using this downtime to kind of rethink and uh, reorganize how the harvester works, our staffing, Sheila, my marketing person retired. Right. Uh, so uh, 
just using this downtime to get ready for when we can reopen. Dylan, and then uh, same with you. You have that music sort of promoter background. You kind of understand the the artist's side of it. And uh, and uh, you've been doing, I mean, you've been staying busy. I know you had a crowdfunding, a big crowdfunding event. Um, so you're still trying to bring that money in, even though you can't function as, it's not business as usual for you. Well, yeah, I I, I do have a background in, in promotion, uh, production. Um, I, I did fall in love at the Floyd Country Store with uh, the musical community that plays music for different reasons. It's not so much financially motivated. And that's a lot of what I've started working on here is really getting to know the, the um, you know, the living traditions of the, of the musicians around Southwest Virginia and doing a lot of that work through um, our sister organization, the Handmade Music School. Uh, so a lot of our focus um, with the fundraiser, which some friends of ours put together to help us was really, like I said, to help our staff be able to survive for us to be able to continue to do this because this, um, the Floyd Country Store, we don't, my wife and I don't feel like we own the Floyd Country Store. This is a community um, venue. We are stewards of the Floyd Country Store and it's an important institution for Southwest Virginia and we have to caretake it and make sure it's us here on the other side of this pandemic. But the main thing that we're doing to, to produce content is to produce this uh, workshop series for musicians so that as they're stuck at home, unable to tour, that they're able to share their uh, their gifts, their, their musical experiences, because uh, even though I've been a promoter for a long time, I also fell in love with music education, went back when I was at Jefferson Center, and that's really near and dear to my heart. And mu musicians uh, are happy to take this downtime and share their music with, uh, you know, students uh, all around the world. So even though this has been a drag, um, mm -hmm. the pandemic has opened our eyes, just like Gary was saying, we're rethinking this. There's people internationally that are reaching out to us now, so happy that we're producing this content online and they're telling us, don't stop doing it when the pandemic's right. over. So yeah. we're realizing that even though this has been a really difficult time, that it's forcing us to be innovative and, and creative and think about ways that we can connect with our audience that love this stuff. And so that's what we're doing. We're gonna be here on the other side and we are so grateful for the support that we received. And we're also supporting the musicians with that, with those funds as well, to make sure that musicians that aren't putting food on their table by touring, um, right. we're reaching out to help them as well. So we're just doing everything we can to make sure that the musical community is strong and vibrant and that we take care of each other. So Tyler, then back to you, because again, as they said, and what I keep hearing as I do this show is that people are really using this downtime to sort of either regroup or come up with new innovative ideas. How are you guys using this time to, to make sure you come out at the other end? Well, I tell you what, we're, we've kind of dove head first into this. You know, I, I look at this whole series of events um, as opportunities and it's the organizational sort of philosophy for us is built around the idea of resilience and built around the idea that we really aren't guaranteed anything beyond tomorrow. And not guaranteed anything beyond where we are right now. So for us, it, it was not a matter of, I mean, there's certainly a downtime in the first part of the pandemic where we kind of sat back and said, what do we do? But when we got to the end of our August, you know, we really felt, and, and it just couldn't have happened without other people going out and helping to establish best practices. But it's not a matter of whether or not we can do live events or bring people together. It's a matter of how do we do that? Now, it may not be in the tens of thousands of people to see a Beyonce show for the millions of dollars that they might put on a production call, but it doesn't mean that we can't find ways to do it within small, manageable size events that may not bring artists the same pay that they might have gotten before and the promoters the same pay they got before. It's a matter of us all reestablishing what makes sense from a financial side as well as a risk management side. So for us, what does that mean? You know, since August, uh, we started to put on our outdoor series and Gary and Jackson have been incredibly uh, supportive of me and over the years and you know one of the things that allowed us to start to think about what does an outside event look like was someone else going first and taking a risk 
and establishing these sort of norms and reactions that we can look at, say, how is the crowd managed during a concert these days? People talk about how do you mitigate the space between people? What are the best practices that we can, that we not only have to establish, but we're currently establishing. And that goes with cleaning the stages. How do you handle your mic control between different bands? How do you establish crowd control where you keep people separate, manage you know, all your rules and regulations without right. doing anything that's negative to the broader context of our, of our, of our world today? Um, so for me, we've done an incredible job of moving outside. Our staff has all done an amazing job of reimagining what that experience can look like outside. And for us, as we go into 2021, the relationships that we've established because of the best practices we've been able to put in place, and largely because we've been uh, so far, uh, luckily, we've been so far you know, free of any outbreaks or any issues, these things allow us to look into 2021 with the same sense of confidence and the same sense of saying, where do we build on from the, right here? It's almost like it gives you a breather. I mean, it's not the best way to take a breather, but it gives you a chance to reevaluate things. And uh, Kate, sort of with you, I know we're coming into winter season, so the, I guess the outdoor season is is kind of done. Uh, what are you doing sort of, what do you normally do during the winter time? And then how are you planning for 2021? <laughs> sure. Um, well, I would say maybe this year more than any other, um, I would maybe resist thinking that the outdoor season is done. Um, and I think that um, people need to spend time outside because if we all hunker down inside, we're gonna not see each other. Um, we're not gonna get out there. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're actually, um, you know, we're, we're still brainstorming. We're doing a lot of um, planning and we're actually sitting in conferences and seeing how other parks and rec agencies across the, um, the United States are, are handling this time um, and trying to come up with, um, basically reasons for people to gather outdoors because we know that it is far lower risk um, than being inside right now. Um, so that's kind of the most helpful, healthy thing that we can do um, if we're gonna be having music and gathering. Um, and we do need that for our community and for our mental health. Um, but yeah, I'd say, so the winter we spend, um, we spend kind of, you know, looking at what we've done, reporting on it. Um, and actually we are filling up our calendar right now um, at Elmwood Park for 2021, um, getting all the legacy events back on. Um, and I think it's really important because continuity is such a important um, piece of momentum that's involved in creating our culture and our communities. Um, having organizers as you know um, creative and resilient and determined um, as the people that are on this panel right now, um, kind of tr looking forward to the future and seeing not, well, can we do this, but not not that, but how um, is really important. So hopefully we see a lot of the same events come back in 2021. Um, and so far it looks good. Well, I have about three minutes left. So I wanna give each of you just a, a few minutes to sort of tell me what your 2021 looks like. God willing, we're going to be moving forward and maybe get back to normal, but uh, what is your 2021 looking like? Let's go with you, Gary. 2021, uh, we're gonna be gone, hopefully full bore. Uh, I might be outdoors, you know, sort of depends on what this virus is doing, uh, but We've got some amazing acts, you know, booked and ready to go. Uh, so I'm hopeful that we're going to get this virus solved sooner than later. And I also would just like to say, I miss everybody out there. Mm. I miss all you guys that are on the screen. And uh, thank you very much. All right, Dylan, how about you? And, and you know, what, what can people do to continue to support you and the rest of you? Yeah, well, I think uh, w all of us here and uh, are in the music um, world for a reason because these are creative, interesting, you know, people. I mean, they're creatives. You know, they know how to move. They they know how to navigate through this type of thing, as do all the people on the screen today. And I think we're all super fans of one another, and we support each other, and we want everyone to be successful. And uh, we're just going to keep doing it. We're going to keep trying to wake up every day and, and love what we do, love music, um, and make sure we get it out in front of people and that people are engaging with it. For us here at the store, 
um, 2021 is going to be, you know, we're just taking it one day at a time. We're going to hopefully get back to some in-person things when warm weather gets back. If we're still in the pandemic, we'll go back outside. Um, and we'll keep putting things out there online for people to enjoy while they're hunkered in their homes. We're going to launch a, a winter workshop series that will allow people to, to um, keep learning and engaging. And that's all we want to see people do and um, wish everyone well. We miss everyone also and can't wait to get back to a Friday night full of dancers on the floor. It's going to be <laughs> a good day when that comes. About a minute left. Jamie? Um, well, we're definitely planning on staying uh, virtual until the springtime. We do have a really great artist that we have had before that we love named Ari Hest scheduled for the springtime in March on the 26th, but we're playing it by ear. We're not taking anything for granted. Um, so that may end up being pushed back. It's already been pushed back. It was actually supposed to be on March 26th of 2019. Um, I'm sorry, 2020. And now it's March 26th of 2021, excuse me. Um, but we'll be virtual until spring at least, and then we'll see where we can go from there. Uh, we do have a really good event coming up Friday, November 13th. We've got Tyrell Vaughn on live stream. Um, and then um, if anybody wants to check that out, it's on our Facebook and Instagram. Okay, last, uh, real quickly, Tyler, what can people do to help, help you out? Well, they can first off go to our website and explore all the work that we do beyond our live events. But ultimately, as we head into 2021, we not only believe that events should happen, we believe events can happen. We also believe they will happen. Um, it's a matter of how we adjust, and it's a matter of how we come together as a community to establish and learn from each other about the challenges that we, that we face. Um, but the reality really is that none of it happens without us to coming and taking some sort of risk and taking some sort of uh, next level effort to get us there. Um, I'd like to think that Five Points Music is, is feels confident enough that if we go into 2021, we can establish roles in which we can help other people and we can push our best practices out there so more people can learn from us as well. Okay. And we can and that collaboration is so important for me. Right, absolutely. Well, listen, have to run. I know we could spend another hour talking, but I want to thank all of you for being here, wishing you the best of luck. We are all, all the viewers, all of us here are going to try to support you as best as we can and uh, just uh, hang in there. And thanks all of you for joining us as well. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.